Actually, very glad to hear that we have people that are interested in cultural heritage and law, and because there are a lot of these things that are very relevant to the subject area. Um, the Library of Congress in the U.S., for example, has tried to archive its data in DNA, and they have been a lot of attempts to use the uh, medium for various uh, applications related to cultural heritage. And, uh, it inspires computing, new computing paradigms. I won't have time. I'm just bringing up all these different directions this can go. I put the word computing there. <laughs> uh, but I probably won't be able to go into specifics because um, it would take too much time. Please feel free to ask me more questions about it. But the important part of this talk is that I omitted machine learning on purpose. <laughs> it will make an appearance at the end because. Uh, as I said, I let my students uh, tell me what they want to do. And even in this area, they found uh, a way to sneak in some machine learning. But the superstar of this talk will not be machine learning. It will be DNA, obviously, and uh, communication and coding theory. Just to so show the communication and coding theory are still alive and kicking. And I, I'm very happy to say that uh, at information theory conferences these years, they have been a lot of uh, talks on coding for DNA computing and storage. So uh, because it's a very broad overview of the whole subject area of coding and communication theory for DNA-based data storage, I am assuming no knowledge of coding theory either. So I will start with the basics of coding theory. And uh, if you're a coding theorist or information uh, theorist, the first thing you will probably learn or see in, during the introductory lecture your professor provides is this picture. And it looks like a very interesting, simple graph where you have two nodes on the left, two nodes on the right, but it's not really a graph. It's what we call a channel. And the channel has a special name. It's a binary symmetric channel. And it explains to you what happens to a single bit, a zero or a one, when you pass it through a channel. And it explains it in a probabilistic way. So if you pass, um, let me see if this is going to work. If you pass a zero, oh, kind of not okay. Let me try the mouse. Ah, there we go. So if you pass a zero, uh, you may get a zero if you output the correct information with probability one minus p, and p is assumed to be less than one half. It's a probability between zero and one. And if you uh, send a zero, there is a chance that it will flip and become a one. So you're introducing an error. And since the name suggests symmetric channel, uh, by symmetry, the same things may happen to the symbol or the bit one. It can be the same with probability one minus P at the output of the channel, or it can flip and become a zero. So in the early days, people were concerned, in early days of coding theory, many decades ago, they were concerned with how to protect yourself against these ordinary, most basic types of bit flip errors or so, uh, uh, substitution errors, as we call them. And they came up with the most obvious solution that everyone can think of, it's repetition coding. So let's assume I want to send through a channel like this, a string 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. What I can do in a naive way is repeat every symbol three times. So I send a 0 uh, in terms of repeating it three times. Rather than sending 0, I send three zeros. Rather than sending the next one, I send three ones. Rather than sending the next one, I send three ones. So when I do this, I effectively expand my string threefold. So if I want to send three bits, I actually have to send out nine bits. And that means that I reduce the effective rate with which I communicate to one third of what I should have really done. But then it's also obvious that I can try to figure out in a naive way if errors happen. Because imagine that uh, in this, these three zeros, blue zeros, you saw a single one. You would do something like majority logic and say, oh, there were two zeros and one one. That one must have been, oops, that one uh, must have been, I'm oh, sorry, this one, the, the computer jumped on its own, sorry. Uh, that uh, zero uh, must have been a one, uh, that one must have been a zero, so you can correct an error. And if you know that the probability of flipping bits is very high, then you can do not three repetitions, but five repetitions and so on. 
But the disturbing fact was that you're losing so much in the communication rate. Right? You have to triple, you have to uh, fivefold increase what you sub uh, submit in terms of the number. So it wasn't uh, the best possible solution in coding here. Yes. I mean, the, the, the length of the string becomes the infinite. It was a matter of course at the end, right? Right. Yeah. So, so, yeah, but the rate, uh, we, uh, if you measure the e efficiency of information transmission, uh, you still have a ratio, and that ratio of what we call in uh, informa number of information bits uh, the, and uh, the total number of bits, that is something that can is between zero and one. Yeah, both of them can go to infinity, but the ratio will still stay between zero and one, for sure, yeah. So, um, uh, mm -hmm. And Claude Shannon was the first person to, uh, to come up with the, uh, he had errors in his proof, <laughs> everybody can make errors, even Claude Shannon, mm -hmm. but he was the first one to propose uh, an abstract way to describe how well can you do it, uh, how well can you communicate through uh, channels that have the potential to flip every bit of information. Because if you look even at this example, even if, if I increase the, uh, if, even if I transmitted every bit as uh, 15 copies in some, under some bad uh, uh, probabilistic settings, I may still have to, uh, I would, may still make errors because the majority in one block of the bits could have been flipped. So what Shannon did is he quantified what is the largest rate with which you can transmit Bits. So what is the largest ratio of useful bits versus total number of bits that you can uh, transmit information through a channel and still in the setting, as you mentioned, uh, as the length goes to infinity, get a probability that goes to zero, probability of error that goes to zero with the length n, okay? And this is what was called the uh, channel capacity. And I won't show you any formulas, and this was the birth of uh, information theory. Shannon basically told you something uh, that was very counterintuitive at that time. Even if uh, you have channels that can flip every bit with some probability, uh, uh, like in this case, you can get a chance to communicate through that channel with a rate that is not zero. You don't have to infinitely repeat, quote unquote. Uh, you can still have a useful communication rate if you do things in the right way. And um, this is what I said, but before Shannon, there was someone else, Hemming, who is my personal hero. He did the uh, Hemming codes that are much so more sophisticated versions of uh, uh, repetition codes uh, years before Shannon's theory, and even have a medal. We obviously have the Shannon Award in the information theory community, but we also have, have something called the Hemming Medal for contributions to coding theory. And he described a picture uh, that we use again in every introductory class on uh, error correction coding that describes uh, uh, a Hemming code, which has parameters length seven, uh, and it transmits uh, four useful information bits and adds only three control bits to uh, enable you to correct any single error in those seven bits. And how does the Hemming code work? The Hemming code works by looking at these bubbles here. And what you do is you place your four useful information bits in these four uh, intersection uh, areas. And then you choose P1, P2, and P3 in such a way that every bubble has an even number of ones. And I leave it as a little, little puzzle for you to figure out how you could correct errors. But here is an example that where we have a, a satisfied this constraint. I place arbitrary 1110 here. This is what I want to transmit. But in addition, I'm going to transmit Sorry, the mouth keeps disappearing. Uh, uh, this zero here, because to make the number of ones even in this block, I need to add a zero here. To make this number of ones in this uh, 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 circle even, I need to add a one here. And here I need to add a zero to make the total number of ones even. So this is a Hemming code and a lot of the most uh, uh, applicable and frequently used codes uh, 
throughout the decades that followed Hemings work were really extensions and generalizations of these Heming codes. But there's more of wow. coding theory out there. You have source coding that you probably know under the name of quantization and compression, ubiquitous in all sorts of areas of uh, uh, computer science. And you have something called constraint coding. Uh, unlike uh, error control coding or channel coding, where errors happen in a probabilistic way and you really don't know which symbol will be an error. In constraint coding, someone gives you information about what could be the source of error. For example, I am showing here a CD and we all know that we are very sloppy when we handle our CDs, if we even use CDs <laughs> anymore. Most of us are doing our uh, music online nowadays. But imagine in the old days, you know that you're gonna leave your fingerprints on the CD. Yeah. <laughs> you're gonna scratch it, you're gonna leave fingerprints. And if someone tells you what kind of errors to expect, then you can do preemptive coding to get rid of things that you know will very likely happen like scratches and fingerprints. And that area of coding theory is also something that Shannon came up with and it's called constraint coding. So there are basically a lot of different types of codes, and I will try to touch upon all of them in a, in a certain context, which is this context of um, DNA storage. So when did DNA storage come to life? Uh, roughly 10 years ago. It's a very new field. Most of us give credit to the famous physicist um, Feynman, who gave a talk very he was a very colorful person he gave a talk under the title there's plenty of room at the bottom uh, yeah the 60s right and uh, this talk is credited for sort of setting uh, the path for nanotechnology and in that talk he brought up the possibility of using molecules to store information and that was in the 60s and it took about 50 years for two groups um uh uh, George Church's group that it was is jointly at Harvard and MIT and Goldman's um, uh, group in the UK to propose a system for storing information in DNA, which uh, both of them were all pretty much identical, if I may say so. They, they had the exact same components. They looked very, very similar. And here is what you need to know about DNA storage. It's much simpler than it sounds, and it's not science fiction as many believe. You can do this if you have uh, enough money to spare, let's say $15,000, uh, you can encode the image of your favorite cat like I did, or <laughs> a bunch of other things. So what do you do if you want to store information in DNA? Obviously, you start with that information. Let's assume this was uh, from uh, Goldman's paper, so he, he wasn't exactly storing uh, cat images, he was storing Shakespeare sonnets. But uh, let's assume that this is some text or some image, and you have its binary representation. So, sorry, this is moving without me touching it. Uh, whenever I try to move the mouse, it uh, moves to the next slide. There we go. So you have a binary string, and now you want to con uh, record the string onto DNA. All you need to know is that DNA is a molecule that you can abstract as uh, a pair of strings that use a four letter alphabet. You don't need to worry about the actual names, just call them ATGC, okay? And these four letters are stitched together in specific orders, in specific organisms in different ways, sometimes in a very similar way, sometimes in a different way, because not all organisms are the same. And the important thing is uh, that this string of symbols, uh, ATGCs, stitched in a certain order, dictates everything that happens inside of the cell by reading its content, okay? And um, the second important fact is uh, you, every cell will have the exact same, in our body, every cell has the exact same DNA content. And we don't keep our cells for the, uh, from uh, the, our birth to the end of our life, cells duplicate. And there was a lot of Greek, philo there were a lot of Greek philosophers that asked, are we still the same person? 
if, uh, if uh, actually the story was about the boat, you have a boat, you keep fixing different parts of the boat and you keep changing parts of the boat until one day, not a single part of the original boat was there. <laughs> Is it still the same boat or not? It's the question we also have with cells. Cells keep duplicating and uh, old cells die, new are formed. Are we still the same people? Yeah, I leave this philosophical question to someone else, but how is duplication done? This is where the beauty and the genius of nature came about. Duplication is done in what we call a semi-conservative way. So you have not one copy, you have two copies of the same strand of DNA, except that you have something called Watson Creek complementarity. If on one strand you see the green A, on the other strand you must, and must always has some exceptions in biology, but let's pretend that you must see the purple or whatever this color is purple. Yeah. And if you see, let's say a blue, and again, the mouse doesn't work, here we go, the blue, then you have to see this, uh, this uh, red part here. So uh, A always pairs up with T and C always pairs up with G. And the brilliance of nature was to do this pairing so that when you want to replicate, duplicate the content of the DNA during cell division, this pair will spread out and then you can just stitch together a different pair, uh, a copy of another uh, sequence to form one pair and a copy of the other sequence to form a second pair. So you use this pair to create duplicates of the same content you had originally by splitting the pair and then using each of those splitted uh, paired sequences as uh, templates for adding the matching pair. So this is how DNA was designed by nature. And this process of um, uh, pairing up uh, strings that are Watson Creek complementary, basically green with purple and uh, red with blue, is called hybridization. And it's very important in a lot of the things that I will discuss later on. So what did the teams from Church and Goldman's group do? They took only one strand. They didn't use double-stranded DNA. They took single-stranded DNA, and they said they're going to work with single-stranded DNA. They took every pair of bits from the information they wanted to store, and they converted it into one of the four letters, because you have two bits, with two bits, you can store uh, encode four symbols. So they took two bits and let's say zero, zero may have been A, zero, one, purple T and so on. And then they created a content which has four letters, A, T, G, C. And then they contacted a company in uh, uh, either IDT or Twist, a commercial company. And they told the company, create or synthesize this DNA for me. It was, it's that simple. You don't even have to do the synthesis yourself. And what would the companies do? They would say, let's grab an A, let's grab a T. Think of beads. Someone has four types of beads and you tell them, make me a necklace that has a red bead, a blue bead, a red, red, green. And the company will take the beads, stitch them together, create one string and create many copies. That's important, many copies of that string. They never give you just one single string. They will say, here, you have thousands of uh, the beads that, uh, beaded uh, strings that you requested, and that process is called DNA synthesis. Once you have it, you get a pool. Imagine uh, a set of spaghetti, the, the, be uh, the stitched beads together form strings that are spaghettis that have no order. So you get a mix without any order, and that's called the DNA pool. And then since order in biology uh, wasn't deemed important anyhow. Uh, uh, you could take the whole spaghetti pool and send it again without knowing what the system does to a sequencer. And we all know that DNA sequencing has revolutionized medicine and other areas. There are many platforms that um, do this. Illumina is probably the most well-known one you prepare the sample, you put it through the machine, and then the machine tells you there was one spaghetti that had A, A, T, T, C, G, A in it, another one that had this, and 
you get copies of the same thing. Sometimes you will see the same string uh, uh, multiple times, because if you synthesize many copies of the same string, you will see those copies at the output. And these machines, Illumina machines, are not exactly cheap. They're half a million dollars, the ones that are, and uh, they're extremely efficient. You can sequence now human genomes in a matter of a day. When the human genome project started, it took years to sequence a human genome. But this is how the first DNA storage system looked like. All you had to do is take two commercially available systems, one where someone will stitch the beads for you together, and another one where someone gives you a device that will tell you, oh, I found this collection of beads in one string, this collection of beads, ordered collection of beads in another string. That was it. And one paper ended up in um, science, one paper ended up in nature. And it was r really an amazing idea. I would guess uh, Feynman put it forward first, but uh, this showed in 2012 uh, and 13 that you can do it without blinking. It's a science fiction. We can read DNA and we can create DNA. And uh, the reason why I got into this field was for uh, the acknowledgement of uh, Goldman's group saying that they were very grateful to David McKay for helping them out with some coding problems. And I'm all, okay, the moment someone mentioned coding in the paper, I immediately get the comments from biologists saying, can you please tell us what, what they did? Apparently, Goldman, uh, Goldman consulted David McKay, who has unfortunately passed away mm -hmm. since, and he told them how to, get, uh, how to implement the system to exploit things we know from digital communication yeah. theory before. So what Goldman told them, he said, since creating these beads is very expensive, the process of synthesis is very expensive. That's why I mentioned if you have $15,000, not $15, <laughs> the process is expensive. It makes sense to compress your data before you store it. So he suggested to Goldman compress first. It will save money. Then go, uh, at that time, the machines that were mostly used were Roche 454. Those are the machines used for reading. And they would have trouble reading this uh, very long repeats of the same type of beat. Let's assume a, 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 15 times. And then it's something that even in classical communication uh, caused errors. Because when you see that things don't change for a long time, you can use loose synchronization. You can have various problems. And without any you know, reference to DNA storage. People have been working on these codes called run length limited codes, where you really didn't want to allow the same symbol to be repeated way too many times. Uh, McKay advised the, the Goldman group to keep the run length small, and they went a bit too far. They kept it uh, so small that they never allowed a symbol to be repeated more than once which effectively reduced the health of the society. I think they probably did not heed his advice exactly as he intended to, but uh, basically the alphabet went down a little bit, but there was data compression to help. And how would they, because they had to store these, um, uh, this information in a soup of strings and the strings were very short. Uh, they were roughly hundred length, 100 symbols from ATGC. So then in this soup, how would I know which part, of, which spaghetti came first, which spaghetti came second, which spaghetti came third? And then they did something that again, mathematicians and coding theory theorists have used many times before. They said, we are in going to encode by uh, uh, encoding overlapping pieces. So what they did is, uh, let's say the string was of length 1,000. So they started by taking the first 100 and they converted it into DNA. Then they took the next 100, but starting from location 25 to 125. Then they took the next 100 starting from location, sorry, okay, I cannot get the mouse to work. There we go. So starting from 100, uh, uh, sorry, starting from 50 to 150, 
uh, 50 to 150 and so on. So you had a fourfold, what we call a fourfold coverage. Every segment was uh, present in, except for the ends, every segment was present in four different DNA pieces. And then the order became irrelevant because what you would need to do is look at sequences that have matching suffix, pref uh, suffixes and prefixes of line 75. So they did reconstruction by saying, here is a string and it has this content at the, its last 75 position. I need to find the string that has this, these same 75 symbols in that order at the beginning. So suffix, prefix, suffix, prefix matching. And that obviously further reduced their rate of coding because they repeated effectively everything four times. So this is the coding part that Church and Goldman did, and it was pretty much identical for both papers. So when we started looking at the system, and that, this was 2013, as soon as uh, I think Goldman's paper came out, is, uh, okay, these people did great. They even included coding, which is awesome because you like coding. But the, the first thing if you do digital storage is you say, where is your random access? <laughs> <laughs> they had, they wanted to read one Shakespeare sonnet and they had to flip liter, uh, you know, figuratively through the whole book until they found that sonnet. There was no, oh, on page number so-and-so is that sonnet so that you can find that page number. And that's because in their ordering, they had something to avoid further errors that said, this is the first block, second block, but you had errors there, you could not find what you were looking for and it wasn't clear, how could you find a specific part, a specific sonnet you were looking for? So at that time I told my colleague, okay, this is a great line of work, but there's no such thing as a DNA, uh, as any storage system without random access. Second, although people now claim they wanna use it for archival storage only, at that time, it wasn't clear that you don't want to have features such as rewritability. And how would you rewrite the content if you're storing your content through overlapping strings? So if I wanted to change this content, rewrite it, I would need to find all the strings that contain it, four of them, and rewrite the content of all four of them. That would have been really complicated to do. And the good news is we found a solution for that. And I won't talk about it. I can discuss it um, later on. Uh, uh, we, the solution was do not store things with overlaps. Store things by adding addresses. That will solve all your problems. If you are uh, someone who does computer science, you know that every memory block has its address. You need to have addresses. Otherwise, there is no storage system. And what is an address in DNA? It's another string. You append at the beginning, at the end of the string, you append an address block. And if you have those addresses, they will also tell you in which order the strings come for, uh, are supposed to come. And they allow, will allow you to get rid of these overlapping fragments if you add coding redundancy to the whole block with addresses. And uh, unfortunately, I don't know how to get rid of um, the bottom to show you the publication. This was our original solution to uh, random access in DNA. And it appeared in 2015. And the idea for random access was to use these addresses and nature's method of duplicating content. In uh, one thing I didn't mention, when nature wants to duplicate a content, certain content, read a certain content, Sometimes it needs to uh, read a content from position A to B. It needs to tell you that it wants to read things from A to B. And it does that by creating short strings that identify the locations, they're called primers. And then only something between those two locations will be replicated. So now our addresses serve as those primers in biology. And if we want to read only this block, we would add only primers that match those addresses. And then we would run what nature does, replication, twofold, fourfold, eightfold, sixteenfold, until everything in the soup of spaghetti you have 
is the string that you're looking for. And it's random access by amplification, basically. And I'm very proud of this line of work. And I unfortunately cannot show you the paper. And um, uh, proud, uh, proud and a little bit uh, unhappy because the credit now for this discovery goes to Microsoft. Because, oh. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's quite hurtful, but it's also, you know, imitation is the best form of flattery. Uh, Microsoft showed that what we did would work on very large file sizes. And uh, the IARPA group study showed that this approach to random access actually scaled really well. And they claimed it's a great idea by Microsoft. I'm trying to convince you it's actually work from... You can't just move. Oh, it's, it's okay. I can share the publication. Um, Okay. Uh, to have the reference because it's very important for us. <laughs> there we go. Let me oh, great. Okay. 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 So um, um, here it is. The paper was called A Rewritable Random Access DNA Based Data Storage System from 2015. And uh, not only did we explain how to do random access, we also explained how to do um, uh, rewriting. And we used a lot of coding. And that's why we probably didn't become as famous as Microsoft because there was a lot of math. And unfortunately, I only learned later, you do not put too much math in bio papers because the number of, uh, the impact uh, exponentially decreases with the number of formulas, unfortunately. And we had follow-up papers, which we wisely sent to information theory journals where we said, how do you design these address sequences so that you get uh, random access quality and scalability to the point that you can ensure that you will always get what you want. Yes, please. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So this uh, method of accessing mm -hmm. the, the, the streams through the, mm -hmm. through the uh, edges mm -hmm. could be comparable to, to, a, to a linked list uh, mm -hmm. data structure so that you see yes, like yes. a pointer to the next. Uh, uh, um, um, in this case, the link list would be, again, unordered. It would be a link set because there is no order. But you're right. If I want to read this, 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 and this, I will add the right pairs, but in a mixture. The order doesn't matter. They would find their soulmates. And that is like, as I explained, because DNA in a, uh, likes to stay in a two-string uh, uh, two bonded hybridized form. So if you put those primers into things that have singles, uh, just one strand, mm -hmm. they, they, they will find their soulmates, nice. attach themselves, and then just work on those. The rest will be left uh, undone, except if you were unlucky enough that the address appeared as data yeah. somewhere. Exactly. And that was the important part in the paper that created a lot of math, because that means I want to encode the user information to avoid the addresses inside the user information, because then I could copy wrong stuff. Exactly. And it, no, it's not going to hurt me, but it's a wasteful thing, because I will keep getting some fragments of things that I didn't want to read. How many bits of information did you use for the, for the address? That's a very good question. Um, uh, at that time, everybody, as I mentioned, Church and Goldman were using like 100. And imagine if uh, if I want to have addresses and I want to have error control coding, I am wasting too much if I add all of this to uh, a string of length 100, because the addresses are usually about 20, and you want them on both sides. You have to have them on both sides. So then we talked to companies, and they said, oh, you can have DNA much longer than 100. And those are called G blocks. And the company we got them from is called IDT, Integrated DNA Technologies. So the reason why we went with long blocks was we're information theorists, coding theorists. You know, everything is better with longer blocks, more powerful codes and whatnot. And we were criticized a lot for going with larger blocks because they said, oh, um, larger blocks are harder to stitch together. They were, that's true in 2015. 
but then you save so much because you don't need to add addresses of length 40, 20 here, 20 here, 200, and immediately lose 40% of your uh, string length. Here you add 20, 20 on 1,000, you're not losing percentage-wise that much. And we argued, and no one believed us, but then again, Microsoft switched later on to longer ones. They, they are still using um, uh, these pools, unordered pools, because they have a partnership with Twist Bioscience, uh, uh, and they tend to make shorter blocks. We stuck to IDT, and now you can have 3,000 length G blocks. And I think longer and longer blocks will be will be possible for sure. So, um, and uh, these are some coding theoretic requirements. I don't want to go over them, uh, but I'm listing them in the papers where we discuss them that you have to have for your um, uh, addresses. And the interesting thing that I mentioned is the most important coding part was how do you avoid that your information block, your information content doesn't contain by mistake the address. And here, what I'm doing is uh, you may get confused because this is the primer for this uh, sequence here. They're to be read in the Watson complement ma uh, manner. So AA, you have TT here, then you have TAT, which is ATA. So Watson pre complementarity means change the direction and flip A to T and vice versa and G to C and vice versa. And if you're unfortunate, your information block may contain that sequence that you used as an address, how do you avoid that? Apparently, we coding theorists knew about this for decades before DNA storage, because it was uh, uh, an issue in the magnetic recording systems as well, as well, because in uh, recording systems from the past, you use these strings as synchronization strings to recover from loss of synchronization. So you had to make sure that when you see a certain string, you know that uh, you ended up at the 100, uh, 500, 600, 700 position. And if you would see that synchronization string elsewhere, you could completely lose synchronization. So that was also something coding theorists th thought about before DNA storage. So uh, the biggest issue was obviously random access and coding theory helped us with that. But the other issue, let me quickly go back, was this monstrous device here. Uh, half a million dollars for the sequencing device. And second, this is a large thing. Imagine you want to check your pictures and you have to carry <laughs> this monstrosity, which is great for lab work, but you know, you want your storage system to be portable. You want to have something on a memory stick like I have here. You do not want uh, a big aluminum machine. So instead, we started thinking about other types of uh, readout devices, something much smaller. And that was already 2015, 16, where people started talking about devices for reading DNA and reading long strands, which we always wanted. Illumina could read only 300 length, 400 length. So we had to come up with very creative methods to read those long blocks of length 1000 in 2015 with Illumina. Um, we actually used Sanger at the beginning, those of you that know something about DNA sequencing. But at that time, people started talking about what is called the third generation of sequencing devices. And those were portable, some of them, like nanopore devices. They, are, they were roughly the size of two memory sticks. And they could read very, very long DNA fragments, which is another reason why we thought, let's try this. At that time, unfortunately, their error rate was horrible. They are doing much, much better now. But you, you, you have to understand that in this field, breakthroughs happen yearly, but everything starts at the very low level. The error rate was 20, 25%. And you had insertions and deletion errors symbols that were missing or inserted. And if you're a coding theorist, you dread those errors. These are not ordinary, zero becomes a one, one becomes a zero. At that time, people did not really know how to even efficiently do error correction of uh, indels, as we call them, insertions and deletions. And we were told, don't touch nanopores. Don't touch nanopores. You have to have the industry standards of 10 to the minus 15 or whatnot. <clears throat> But we said, let's try it out. And we came up with the system. Again, like before, we had um, 
uh, an address information block. And I'm just showing one address, everything has to come up with paired addresses. We did the uh, compression of images following David McKay's recommendation, something called BNA uh, base uh, 64 conversion. And then we did a lot of coding, some of which I will describe later. And then we called our favorite company and paid them. Not just the call, we need to pay them. And we said, synthesize those uh, blocks of length, of length thousand for us. And um, then we tried the unthinkable. We said, now we did everything pretty much the same, except that the coding part changed like we did in the first part with random access. And now we said, let's try to use nanopores. So what are nanopores? So think of a nanopore as a hole in a substrate. And usually nanopore sequencers don't have just one hole, think of multiple holes. And what do you do? Uh, you pour your spaghetti over this sifter with a bunch of holes. That's what you do when you wanna get the water out of your spaghetti. <laughs> Uh, but now the holes are large enough, designed by, by that way, so that your spaghetti can fly through it. <laughs> it's not designed to get rid of the water. It's designed to get your spaghetti straight through the holes. Okay. So now imagine you have 10 red spaghettis, 50 blue spaghettis and whatnot. These are all DNA strings. And you have a flat surface with a bunch of holes. You pour it over and those spaghettis go through different holes and replicas of spaghettis may go through different holes at different times or through the same hole at different times. So why these holes? These holes have, um, um, uh, uh, are controlled through a, a voltage applied across the membrane. So inside those holes, you will have ions and those ions will uh, create what is called an ion current across the hole. And it's called the resting current. And it's, let's say, uh, at some level, and the mouse, here we go, this is the resting current. And that's the current created by the ions that uh, cross the port, the hole. Mm -hmm. And imagine now you put something inside the hole. The ions will not have access to the other side of the hole. So what will happen is the current will drop. And the drop of the current will depend on what's inside the hole. If you have something tiny, tiny in a big hole, the current will not drop that much. Think of ions, oh, I found my way. I go around the obstacle. It's very simplified, but the intuition should be clear. But if you have something big in there, then the current will uh, drop a lot. It's not size. Uh, if you ask uh, nanopore sequencing experts, they would say, charge is probably more important. Mm -hmm. It's also how, what kind of charge the spaghettis have. In nature, mm -hmm. spaghettis don't have charges, but DNA does have charge. So the charge of what is inside the hole also dictates how much you drop. And usually the holes cannot be made that small to contain only one of the ATGCs. They usually contain multiple ATGC symbols. So what you get is really the drop of the ion current for a combine, uh, for a substring or a group of symbols of roughly four or five, okay? And now someone gives you a single signal like this and you need to deconvolve it to get the identity of the symbols. Was it an A in the first position or a T or whatnot? And the important thing is these symbols fall into two classes, purines and pyramidins. And purines are more similar among themselves and pyramidins are more similar between them. Yeah. So just to, just to summarize that, I'm just trying to mm -hmm. So the spaghetti is basically, I mean, it is the- um, DNA. The, yeah, mm -hmm. that, that's the, the, the soulmate matchmaker, right? I mean, like, yeah. For, uh, yeah. In this case, their, their soulmates are gone because you have to have the technology here. It starts with the soulmates, which is a pair, but then it rips one off and let's only the other part go through the hole. I didn't want to talk about this. So to slow it down, because if it's going to, if it's a single stranded DNA, the spaghetti will fly through it and you will not see anything. So these are so-called motors. Uh, they're called helicases because they're un, they unzip the DNA. And in the process of unzipping, they slow down one of the strands that goes through the hole. 
So, but the soulmates are only used to slow down one of them when they go through the holes. Uh, but what goes through the hole is a single one of the two. There, uh, this that's the technology we use. It's called Oxford nanotechnology. Uh, there are other uh, technologies that can uh, where you can make the hole of different sizes. They're called solid state nanopores. There are a bunch of different natural nanopores, but in this case, their solution was to use holes of a certain diameter, use the Halley case to keep unwinding the soulmates so that one soulmate can control how fast the other one goes through the pore. Because if it goes too fast through the pore, you're, you're done, you cannot read anything carefully. But this is how it works. You let one go through the hole, the hole starting gets blocked to a different degree and it drops uh, to a certain level. And then you have to get uh, to deconvolve these signals to figure out what was in the hole. Uh, yeah. It's kind of a histogram of the current. Uh... Uh, uh, so this is just the plot of the drops in the current, basically what- um, For that particular- For that particular string, string. right. And then you have to find the components. So, like right. the, so you have to take an analog signal and convert it into a sequence of ATGCs. Now yeah. ONT is doing it through deep learning. <laughs> yeah, and it looks like a frequency. I mean, if, if it was a frequency, it's like a, it's like a, um, um, making a frequency analysis, um, like a Fourier transform. Um, in the, 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 the yes, it's an analog signal. You could know there were different methods to try to do it. The problem with it was so noisy because you have this yeah. and you go figure out was it an A or a T. And as I said, two symbols were very similar, two other symbols are very similar. How do you distinguish them? Similar in terms of chemical properties. So that's why they tried a lot of different things. And I think the machine learning, the neural network component helped a lot and they improved the core. And it's all proprietary. People don't even know now exactly what kind of core is used, but the, the idea is that. And this is an illustration from the coding theory perspective. So you have a string and that string can go through multiple pores. And when I say that string, once a string goes through a pore, the string goes through a pore. But uh, remember, no string appears only once. You always have thousands of copies of the same string. And that string, one of its copy may have gone here, and then you may have gotten these errors. This G was deleted, this C was deleted. Another copy of that string may have gone through this pore. And then these two symbols may have deleted. So what you will get is, uh, what uh, computer scientists call traces of a string. So you get one string at the input, and then you create a copy of that string at the output where you randomly deleted some uh, symbols, inserted some other symbols, but usually deleted. Then you put the same string through another port. When I say same string, it's replica. Uh, then you get other positions deleted. And then you get a bunch of evidence or traces of that string with different deletions. Mm -hmm. And again, this was advertised in the computer science community uh, under the name of trace reconstruction in 2005. And their motivation was by logic because you, uh, if you are a computational biologist, this would be your ancestor sequence. And that the ancestor sequence gets mutated through deletions and insertions into offspring sequences. And that's how the tree of life is born, through mutations. And uh, phylogenists had to work to find the ancestors, because usually the ancestors are dead. <laughs> you don't see them. Who is the ancestor of all birds? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tough question. We don't know. Some extinct pre-bird, dinosaur, as we know now. <laughs> but um, uh, they worked on these problems uh, uh, called phylogeny, phylogenetic tree reconstruction. And then this uh, group of computer scientists, Batu and others in 2005 said, let's analyze phylogeny through this idea of traces. And it turns out way before all of this, there was Levenstein, <laughs> a Russian mathematician, who basically came up with a similar problem in the realm of coding theory. It was called uh, Levenstein's reconstruction problem. Mm -hmm. But uh, Batu and all knew about it and they mentioned it in the paper and if computational biologists really give huge credit to Levenstein for his work 
because the edit or Levenstein distance is used a lot in phylogenetic tree analysis. Mm -hmm. You exactly you need to do alignment. That's the key. So how do you reconstruct the original string through methods from computational biology? You take these strings and you try to stitch them together, uh, not stitch them together, but align them to get the ancestor sequence. And that is what is called sequence alignment. And uh, Smith, Waterman, Needleman, Wunsch came up with dynamic programming algorithms for doing these alignments. So that's what we did. We said, okay, we're going to align the sequences. And the good news was we had information about the addresses. So we didn't have to align everything together. Imagine the mess if you didn't have addresses, you tried to align things that are totally different. Now we know the addresses, so we can try to align things with the same address. But the problem is the addresses could have had errors too. So we tried looking at similar addresses and doing alignment, and I'll skip all of this, and the results were far from good. So we had, um, this is the number of uh, spaghetti types we read, of each type we read, and then uh, 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 how many errors we found, and it was a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. So this was length 1,000, we found uh, uh, roughly 100 errors, 80 errors. It, it was really bad, but this was 2015 when we started working on it. And then again, we, this is the picture how the alignments would look like. This is a software, they have funny names. Um, uh, they, they're they actually called um, uh, after food. <laughs> but uh, this was a MATLAB sequence alignment software. Uh, we also tried Muscle and a bunch of others. And they would produce pictures like this. It says, this is what I think is the consensus sequence a sequence that best describes everything that looked like it. And it's, it seems like very little, <laughs> almost everything was an A, I should call it an A. But then sometimes you need to add a gap because there are deletions to get the right alignment. And this is what um, those phylogeny reconstruction alignment algorithms would do to you. But then we had some regions where there was a huge mess. And those regions were the ones that created the problems with the error rates that we saw. So what did we then do? We used uh, communication theory. So if you don't know coding communication in other areas, you would not have come up with ideas to solve these biological problems. In communication theory, in your cell phones, you use something called pilot sequencing. The pilot sequence is a sequence that is known to both you and the receiver, and you send that sequence, and then the receiver, when the receiver gets the sequence and sees a lot of errors in it, the receiver can say, don't send information, the channel is very bad, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. So the pilots help you estimate the channel. So our addresses had to be known to both us, the ones that reported the information, and to the, those who were supposed to read the information. So the addresses are pilots. And what we did is we only took those DNA sequences where both us that recorded and us that read the information, knew that the sequence was exact, which would mean the pore through which it went, the spaghetti went, was probably a good pore, because I told you there are many pores and not all of them are equally good. And um, those pores tend to tire. Some pores may have read a lot of spaghettis and gotten very tired, which means at the end they would be sloppier. So we use the, pi uh, the addresses as pilot sequences and only aligned those sequences that have intact addresses without any errors. And the results improved drastically. We ended up having a few errors. And uh, the, those errors we then re uh, iteratively got rid of by recruiting uh, reads or basically fragments or spaghettis that now have one potential errors in the pilot sequence or address sequence, then two. And then we were left with really one or two errors in the strings, which was amazing for those days. Now you can do much better. And people ask, what is the point now that the pores are better? There is no problem. You can still use this method and you can reduce the time of sequencing. At this time, we had to wait 12 hours to collect enough good uh, sequences now, if you, the sequences are better, you can stop earlier and you can still 
decide where to stop once you see that the pilot sequences are good enough to reconstruct the, the, the original content fast. So it, it tells you something about when do you need to stop reading. It dictates, and as the, the better the pores get, the sooner you can stop, but the method of figuring out when to stop based on alignment is still going to be like this. And uh, I'll, I know I'm getting close to overtime, so we did a bunch of coding solutions to deal with the residual errors, uh, and we did coded trace reconstruction, basically design strings introduce redundancy in the strings we are encoding, coding redundancy, so that when we see multiple copies, the deletions and insertions, we can reconstruct much easier than if we had an arbitrary sequence at the beginning. So that was a very, a completely new area in computer science motivated by biology because we realized this is an example of constraint coding. You remember in constraint coding, I said, you know that you're going to have fingerprints and scratches, so you preemptively do the coding to eliminate those errors. Here, we know that we're going to get many copies with deletions and insertions, and we know what kind of issues we may have. If you, let's say, have A, T, A, T, A, T, and then you delete a few Ts, you may get patterns that are very confusable with something else, so you know what kind of conditions your nanopore will have or introduce and in, uh, what kind of errors it will introduce so you can do this coded trace reconstruction approach. And that is again mathematics and I'll skip it. And it shows that uh, you can have a code rate close to one and still reconstruct the string accurately with uh, um, uh, uh, a, log, a polynomial in log n number of traces. Okay, so um, I know we started a bit late, but um, yeah, just I'll just tell you some other directions without going through uh, the details. Uh, then another coding theory inspiration was why use only four letters? <laughs> Everybody wants to use fewer alphabets where Q is larger than two or uh, flash memories at some point we're using an eight letter alphabet. So what we did in the more recently is we tried to play with nature, which was probably not the best thing, but uh, let me show you. We came up with seven new chemically modified symbols of ATGCs that have very much distinguishable properties when you read them through nanopores. Those had to be selected in a way that not only do you add them as new symbols, they have to be able to form beaded necklaces. They have to be formed to uh, able to form soulmates. There is a lot of chemistry going on here, but then they also have to give you different signatures when they pass through the pores. And let me show you, these are the signatures summarized as uh, probability distributions of the drops of currents uh, for a set of four uh, four tuples of modification, and we call this the nanopore spectrum. <laughs> and the good news is, uh, and the interesting finding is, sometimes the nanopore, for example, here, could not distinguish the order. Was it symbol 2323 three, two, three in that order or 2332? Two, three, three, two? The currents, or uh, the drops of currents were all concentrated around the same value. They were overlapping. But then when you change the current across uh, uh, the voltage across the membrane, you could spread them out. So these are the same symbols, but spread out because you, you can manipulate the voltage across the membranes. And the good news is that we were trying to sell to the biologist is most of your spectrum is unoccupied if you're a communication theorist, which means there are many more symbols out there that will give you a different uh, nanopore current drop, there is plenty of room left here, the spectrum left to fill out, which means you can go crazy potentially with your alphabet size. And uh, there is some coding I'll skip. And then we did what um, these companies usually do with ATGC letters. We implemented our own uh, deep learning architecture, uh, a specialized neural network, which would do classification. 
of the raw current signals to figure out which combination of now four plus seven of 11 uh, symbols we got. The accuracy was good, but not spectacular because I think the nanopores uh, are designed to distinguish ATGCs, not additional symbols, but it's a promising uh, thing to see. And then I'll skip um, everything after this, maybe just a picture of Marlon Brando. We also, <laughs> we also try getting rid of synthesized DNA because I keep telling you one image, $15,000 and such, it's not a pleasant price tag. So we said, DNA is everywhere. Why do I need to pay someone to synthesize it for me? So instead we said, let's just take bacterial DNA, but how do you store information in bacterial DNA? Mm. You can do editing, you can try to change symbols, but that's more expensive than honestly synthesizing it from yes. scratch. So instead of editing symbols, we decided to punch holes in the DNA. So think of your, this is your DNA soulmate, two soulmates wrapped around each other. And now I choose certain locations mm -hmm. and I decide, am I gonna punch a hole in this soulmate, uh, this part of the soulmate or whatever, this part of the soulmate. And if I punch a hole here, I will call it zero. If I punch a hole here, I call it one. And if I don't punch either one of them, I call it uh, a, a two. So it's a three letter alphabet that describes the holes and it does look like DNA punch cards. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, the system we use for punching is the CRISPR-Cas9 complex. And yeah, I got the number. Um, yes. The immune system. Of, yes, and the uh, French a lady, Charpentier, and uh, Jennifer Dadna got the Nobel Prize for chemistry. Well, they are scissors, yeah. Yes, it's like scissors. It's not scissors, exactly. But what is the bacteria? So it's the immune system of a bacteria. Yeah, it's, the, no, no. The, uh, the, if something the invades the bacteria, its immune system cuts and shreds the uh, genetic material of the invader. So this is this is a description of the yeah. the uh, the system of the CRISPR Cas9 system for which they got the Nobel Prize. Yes, yes. So you are really uh, cutting DNA, and you have uh, we didn't use Cas9. We use something else. It can cut only one strand. We don't want to cut both. Yeah. Imagine if we cut a hole on both soulmates at the same location, then you split your DNA into two parts. And this is what we call DNA punch cards. And it got a lot of uh, interest from people because it says you don't need to record anything. You just punch your DNA. And then we did Marlon Brando in it. <laughs> I'll skip all this and the results are super clean. So I just want to show you, this was a long fragment of let's say like thousand. And then we read the sequence, we read the contents of the fragments uh, because we separated the two strands the soulmates, and then the one that had holes uh, started breaking into smaller pieces. And then we read those smaller pieces, and those are the smaller pieces. And I don't care what their sequence is, because this is bacterial DNA. I know exactly what the sequence is. It's in every library. And I only need to find, uh, it, did I get the right location where the cut was or not? And here you see it. Uh, on the left, it's too small to see the counts, but this tells you how many fragments did you see that started at the location you know was supposed to be a location designated to a cut, how many ended at the location designated for another cut. And so all you need to detect is where did the locations of the cut happen. And that, that is how you read the information. And then you can do erasing, which is fantastic. Nature hates cuts. <laughs> Nature hates cuts because that is DNA breakage. It's caused by radiation. It can ruin your DNA. So nature invented things that will try to seal off all possible cuts. And those are called ligases, the enzymes that do it. So we managed to do rewriting in this way in many, many cycles because we cut and then we ligate. We use the mechanisms for sealing the cuts. And then here is Marlon Brando. We wrote Illinois for lack of better things to write. <laughs> then we erased everything using those ligases to seal off the cuts. Then we changed it to Granger because Granger gave us a lot of money to create a new college. <laughs> you know how these things go. And then there was a lot of interesting coding theory. 
He suffered along the way because we used Marlon Brando images without the consent of his family. Okay. <laughs> and we had to look, get Hollywood lawyers to help us out get the copyrights. <laughs> it was quite a lot of work, more work to get the Marlon Brando images in, but I was a big fan. I couldn't resist myself. <laughs> Hopefully we weren't better. And uh, we used machine learning to improve the reconstruction quality of Marlon Brando images. And uh, without, and this is a little bit of a blasphemy, without coding redundancy, <laughs> because there is now a huge push for images, not for text and other things, to try to use machine learning methods such as image, um, uh, 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 image enhancement, image smoothing, um, imputation methods, where you train on a large database base of images like ImageNet, and then when part of the image is missing, you just impute it. And uh, this is how Marlon Brando looked before he, oops. This is how Marlon Brando looked. Again, the mouse, here we go. Marlon Brando looked before he went to DNA. And this is how Marlon Brando looked after he left DNA. And I would guess this one looks even better. It was a very yeah, bad movie, yeah, but yeah. a very nice <laughs> image. And this is Apocalypse Now. Uh, again, uh, we tried to see if we had uh, non-uniform uh, uh, error correction redundancy, if we can make the images look better. We didn't see much difference. But basically, you can get rid of some coding redundancy for images using um, deep learning as well. And this is where I stop. I know I went over time. So thank you a lot. And if you have any questions, let me know. This is the list of people that worked on all these problems. A lot of them are uh, also collaborators of people here at Sergi. Let me just uh, uh, mention those that I know are interested, have collaborations with Sergi, Alexei Aksimentiev, Nanocore simulation expert. Um, Minye is his collaborator also, in, oh, okay. an incredible lady also working in Nanocore sequencing. Alvaro Hernandez is the director of our sequencing center who did so much to help us out with, uh, uh, you know, even negotiating good prices for DNA and whatnot, and a lot of really good students and postdocs that worked on this project. So I know I'm over time, so I can't go over all names. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alisa, for this uh, really fascinating talk. A lot of, a lot of information. I really regret uh, 